you remember from a few slides ago, uh, at the very beginning, mitochondrial DNA is testing from two different regions on the cell uh, compared to this uh, to the CRS testing. So the first page that you see, it, it's the uh, HV1. The second page is the HV2. And the bottom of the page will show you the key, what they were looking at on these very specific points, whether there was a nucleotide that matched, um, whether uh, certain uh, of those, uh, the TCAG were observed in those sections, and that's where you get all of uh, this interpretation. So rather than uh, sticking it through a machine and getting those peaks, what you're seeing is you're seeing this graph. And this is how the mitochondrial DNA is going to be um, analyzed. So in 2004, using, uh, or in the case of U.S. v. Beverly, the Sixth Circuit held that mitochondrial DNA was generally accepted by the scientific and legal community as an accurate and reliable DNA testing method. So that was something extremely new. And like in our cases, now that we have this case that says this is a very scientific method that can be used. Um, anything that happened from before 2004, we can cite this case saying, now we have the technology to do this correctly. So what were the possible results when you get a DNA test? One is that it's excluded or cannot be excluded. You're never gonna see in, uh, in a nuclear DNA analysis included. That is never a term that they can use. It's either excluded or cannot be excluded. You may also see that they are a possible contributor or not a possible contributor. And finally, that there's no conclusion or that it's inconclusive. So my suggestion to all of you as budding attorneys is that if you have DNA testing, get your own independent expert to review that testing. Um, especially if the results were inconclusive or they could not interpret them, there might have been a change in technology, there might have been, um, you know, the, the sample that they were using may have been degraded, but because of the technology we have today, they can actually do the testing that they weren't allowed to do before. Um, and you also want your expert to look at that raw data and see, did that raw data actually um, support the conclusions of that lab tech? Because we have this issue of complex mixtures nowadays, that might not have been something that the lab tech was aware of, that there might have been multiple contributors just to that one sample. So a few reasons for this inconclusive um, analysis that the lab tech might come up with is that if they don't have a sufficient sample at the, so at the time, uh, the substance or mixtures uh, prevent the extraction of the DNA so they couldn't get the DNA out, or the testing was improperly conducted or incomplete. So just because uh, a lab report might say inconclusive or uninterpretable or not able to be interpreted, that's not a bad thing. It just means we have to dig a little bit deeper to find out what was happening at the time that that analysis was being done and why they came to that conclusion. And it simply could have been that you know they were looking for nuclear DNA at the time and um, the sample that they had was not big enough but under today's conditions, that sample actually might be a, a valid amount to use. So there are absolutely no absolutes in DNA analysis, and there should never be any testimony or any analysis that says they're a match. That is not what we are looking for. That's not what the scientific community has agreed um, on. There are no matches. It's either excluded or cannot be excluded. Okay. DNA analysis does not rest on matching, it rests on probability. So here on the left side of the screen, if you have a single source or the simplest version of, of probability here, it asks a question, what is the chance that a random, unrelated person would have the same exact DNA profile as your client? So this DNA profile is expected to be found in approximately one in greater than 6.8 trillion people. So it's saying that you know, this person has this probability of being uh, the, uh, the source of the sample. And it's looking at the allele frequencies, okay? One step further is if you have the combined probability of inclusion 
they're no longer looking for the number of contributors there, but they're looking at, was this test done completely? Is all the information that we have there at our fingertips? Everything is represented in that electrophorogram. Okay? The problem with the combined probability of inclusion is that if the alleles are dropping in or dropping out, um, this machine cannot uh, tolerate it in order to generate that number. And then we come to probabilistic genotyping. So what this is, in the simplest terms, is it's trying to explain how many contributors and who those contributors are in one sample. And this is looking at a likelihood ratio. So it's, com it's a comparison of the probabilities. Now the simplest equation is this. This equation gets uh, put into a machine and the machine will pop out the, the probability. Right? So let's talk about what this equation actually means. So the likelihood ratio means that what is the probability that the evidence or the mixture that you have, given or assuming that it came from either a suspect, a person of interest, your client, um, as opposed to some unknown person. I've heard it explained where the top is what the prosecution wants to happen, meaning they want to put your client um, as the source, as opposed to what the defense wants, that it's an unknown person, it's definitely not our client, it has to be somebody else. So the easiest way to think about this, right. okay, so say we have this location of the VWA, and we're looking at this graph and there are the alleles from our father and mother, and say there's a 12 on one and a 13 on the other. What this is saying is that what we're looking at is how many people in the population have this 12 allele at this exact location. So, for instance, if this was 25% of the population has this 12 at this location, we get 0.25, right? The same thing is with 13. If it's 25% of the population, we're getting 0.25. We multiply those and we get 0 0.0625. When we plug it into to this uh, equation, on the top would be if that was definitely the person that we're looking for, right? That if the prosecutor says that it is your client and that client was actually found to be, that would be a perfect one over this number of the probability, which is one in 16. So it's saying that at this location, the 12 and 13, that one in 16 people in the population have this exact uh, analysis there, okay? And what they're doing is, they're doing that for every single low size, so like all 20, and then putting that into a computer Getting, uh, putting it through the algorithm and getting this number out. What is the probability that your client or some unknown person is the source of that sample? The problem with this um, is that the samples are extremely challenging, difficult, or very complex, meaning that there are a lot of contributors to, to them. Um, they might not be able to parse out the number of contributors. They might not be able to say, okay, this is definitely uh, the, the profile of this specific contributor. They might be mixed. This is actually very controversial in the scientific community um, because it's changing constantly. This algorithm that these companies are using is changing constantly. And there are some, some companies, um, they want you to buy their product, right? They want you to use their software. Um, so they're gonna try to say that ours is more reliable than someone else. Um, and a lot of scientists are saying this algorithm is not correct or it's not as accurate, there's something better out there. So there is a lot of debate. So these two, I think there is right now maybe seven or eight different um, computer systems and algorithms that are being used for this probabilistic genotyping. So some of them, um, this is a very complex algorithm that is used and it takes into account the, the peak height whereas the other ones may not take into account uh, the peak height. So that is why it's constantly, they're 
scientists are constantly debating which ones to use and which one is more accurate.